Hello, and thank you for tuning in to Answers from the Lab, where we share Mayo Clinic knowledge and advancements on the state of testing and science from laboratory leaders and the people who are making it happen behind the scenes. I'm Dr. Bobby Pritt, Interim Chair of the Department of Laboratory Medicine and Pathology at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. With me today is Dr. Bill Maurice, the President and CEO of Mayo Clinic Laboratories. This is our weekly discussion with Dr. Maurice, in which we learn about updates in the field of laboratory medicine and pathology. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Vanda Lennon, Director of Mayo Clinic's Neuroimmunology Research Laboratory. Dr. Lennon's had an impressive career here at Mayo Clinic, founding and serving as the Director of the Neuroimmunology Laboratory in the Department of Laboratory Medicine and Pathology, and as the Director of the Autoimmune Neurology Fellowship Program in the Department of Neurology. Dr. Lennon's been recognized for her leadership in pioneering research in autoimmune neurology at Mayo Clinic. So Dr. Lennon, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Bobby. It's a pleasure. So um, why don't I start off with a general question. Can you share how you became interested in the field of neuroimmunology and what motivated you to pursue a career in this specialized area? Well, my original education was in Australia. And in Australia, medicine is an undergraduate degree. And um, so that was in the 1960s. <laughs> so <laughs> at that time, that was my introduction to both organic chemistry and um, uh, biology. I'd had no biology till I got to med school. And um, Australia at that time in, was at the epicenter of the world as far as immunology was concerned. They, they got the Nobel Prize in Medicine, Sir McFarlane Burnett, for his concepts of self and non-self and so forth in 1960 and throughout med school I was passionate about everything everything that I was, except maybe public medicine so <laughs> sure the, the, the only things and so after I couldn't decide what to specialize in so I went to Canada to McGill University for internal medicine at residency and then I went led to Melbourne for a PhD in immunology and I was wanting to work on autoimmunity and they put me to work on uh, neurologic autoimmunity as a model of multiple sclerosis and I was absolutely hooked this was the most amazing model of autoimmunity the autoimmune encephalitis but I convinced myself in those three and a half years that it had nothing to do with MS and I'm still uh, see no evidence that multiple sclerosis is autoimmune. It's immune mediated, but it's a whole mixture of diseases that we still don't understand. But that's what my background was. And that led to my wanting to know more about neuroscience. So after the PhD, I went to Salk Institute in San Diego and for postdoc in neuroscience. And I ended up staying wow. there years on the junior faculty. And I was recruited to Mayo to actually by the Department of Neurology. Um, to integrate immunology into the neurology department. Wow, that's a fascinating background, and we're delighted to have you in the Department of Lab Medicine and Pathology. So now you've been at Mayo Clinic for a while. Uh, can you tell us what, in your mind, what makes Mayo Clinic unique when it comes to neuroimmunology or autoimmune neurology testing? Uh, I think the opportunities right from the get-go when I came here for integration of clinical uh, neurology and neuropathology and imaging with basic immunology uh, and lab medicine testing. Um, I went to the then director of lab medicine suggesting that we introduce antibody testing for myasthenia gravis, which I developed when I was at Salk Institute before I came here. And then that led to my interest in paraneoplastic disorders because of myasthenia spinoma mm -hmm. relationship and uh, the small cell lung cancer and lambert eaton syndrome. Also here, the residents are encouraged to spend some time in research, and that's a very big plus, the, the chance to attend conferences and get to know the neurologists, because I'm not a neurologist by training. Um, I think a huge benefit here has been the uh, abundance of very competent, uh, common sense uh, laboratory technicians with a farm and 4-H background um, 
it, that's been a huge plus for me. I've had people working with me for 35 years. They're retiring now. I'm not ready yet. <laughs> um, so I think they're the, the big strengths. And also the patient population, of course, which is mm -hmm. why I came here. I wanted to get back to a clinical environment and it's sure. absolutely incomparable. I don't think I would have stayed out in the cornfields for 45 years. If <laughs> you know, the abundance of clinical challenges that presented by the patients and especially yeah. through um, um, the outreach of Mayo Medical Laboratories or Mayo Clinic Laboratories. That's been just amazing resource. We are very fortunate for all those reasons you mentioned, and it's same that holds true across all of our specialties. For me in microbiology, for example, I specialize in parasites and, you know, being in the cornfields, as you said, you know, the cornfields that do indeed surround our fabulous medical mecca of uh, Mayo Clinic, um, we wouldn't see the types of specimens that we do see mm -hmm. without Mayo Clinic laboratories and also the patients that come here from around the world. But another thing I wanted to highlight that you said is that uh, one of the areas of neurology and neuroimmunology that I think are fantastic is that close, close connection with our patient-facing colleagues. And so we have the patients coming from around the world, the samples coming from around the world, and then our colleagues that are patient-facing, as well as our own DLMP clinicians, and we're all working together uh, developing algorithms together, developing tests together. I think neuroimmunology is just a, a shining example of that type mm -hmm. of strong collaboration. The advances that have occurred during the course of my career are just incredible. I mean, immunoglobulin protein was sequenced when I was a medical student and its structure wow. worked out. And then we went on, not me, but the field went on to discover the genes and the T cells and the B cells, but that was worked out in Australia, the T and B cells mm. story. And monoclonal antibodies mm -hmm. from England and monoclonal antibody therapy, which we were promising 40 years ago, but has really come to fruition in the last 20 years. Well, and it's amazing how we can take all of these advances and then regardless of where they're from, tie them in with our patient population here at Mayo and the tests we offer, mm -hmm. which kind of gets into my next question that you've alluded to already, uh, Vanda, is that these neurologic disorders are complex. They can be complex diagnostic challenges. So in your mind, how does immunology testing contribute to the diagnosis for our patients and the management of these complex conditions? You know, very early on, I realized that it was didn't help the clinicians very much by encouraging them to request one antibody test because because of my integration at that time of my basic and research and clinical uh, lab activities, I was recognizing these patients that had a certain disease like myasthenia gravis, for example, or Lambert Eaton syndrome would have a, a spectrum of autoantibodies, very informative, and it could tell you not just um, what the likelihood was of this being an autoimmune mediated neurological disease, but also what the chances were of there being an underlying cancer. So I think with the detection of an informative autoantibody profile, which is what the lab is now offering, not even antibody tests alone whatsoever. You just have to say, are you, is it a movement disorder that you're curious about mm -hmm. or is it a seizure disorder? So detection of an informative profile in serum or spinal fluid short circuits the patient workup. So it eliminates the need for expensive, unnecessary testing, such as brain imaging and spinal cord imaging. Brain biopsies were done uh, for disorders like chronic meningitis, that they thought it might be tuberculosis or carcinomatosis. And now we know it, it could well be autoimmune GFAP meningoencephalitis. Those patients always had, it's not rare, and they always had brain biopsies they, or meningeal biopsies. Mm. They don't know, don't know. Uh, and it, it allows the, clin the clinician, the primary care person to focus on finding a, otherwise unsuspected cancer if the autoantibody profile points strongly to a cancer underlying like lung or gynecological or testicular or something like that. Yeah, these very uh, 
targeted and disease clinically oriented panels, I think has really been essential for clinical care. And then also they're clinically relevant. It's not uh, just tests that we've thrown together. It's really keeping the patient in mind, which I think is a strength, a huge strength. So quite a lot of them that are often now a kind of reflex. If you have one, it'll lead to another follow-up. Yeah. So the field of neuroimmunology, as we've alluded to, is high, highly interdisciplinary with neurology, Department of Lab Medicine and Pathology, immunology. Can you elaborate on the collaborative nature of your work and how you collaborate with other healthcare providers, such as uh, um, allied health staff, consultants, um, attending physicians, researchers, and even outside of Mayo at other institutions? My collaborations from the time I came here and continuing now have largely been with basic scientists, <laughs> but mm. I've been at the bench seeing through the histories of the serums that are coming into the clinical laboratory, the clinical correlations and the clinical relevance of what we're finding in the lab. So my my initial collaboration, of course, was with a great neurophysiologist, Edward Lambert, who happened to be my husband, but he oh. <laughs> had my interest in that syndrome. But I've continued with neurophysiology uh, interactions, uh, gastroenterology, both basic and clinical, has been a huge interest of mine. And we've put uh, autoimmune GI dysmotilities onto the map because of that. Mm -hmm. um, I've had collaborations with pathologists, the late Bernd Scheitauer, for example, uh, outside of the clinic with neuroscientists who are pioneering different uh, venom toxins that are specific for certain receptors. So we ended up with a whole lot of probes for solubilized uh, ion channels that we can now detect autoantibodies against voltage-gated calcium channels and nicotinic receptors of muscle and uh, neurons. Um, collaborations with oncologists, ophthalmologists, um, and the lab now is collaborating with uh, a, a lot of um, modern molecular biological workers doing these pro protein array uh, display mm -hmm. <laughs> detections, yeah. and it's a great tool for discovery. It's limited, of course, because with just small peptide fragments, you're not going to be picking up antibodies against the complex folded protein, but it still beats the, you know, <laughs> six We're months. We're a long way from the brain biopsy. That's mm -hmm. good news for the patient. So how do you keep up to date given all of the latest research and advancements in the field? Well, personally, I try to keep up with basic neuroscience. I think the Society for Neuroscience meeting is my most important one of the year. I go to neurology conferences. I try to keep up with synaptic circuitry so I can understand what new uh, neurotransmitter receptors are being discovered and so forth. So mostly I've tried to keep ahead or abreast of basic neuroscience and uh, immunology. But more recently, I mean, until 20 years ago, really, there was nowhere outside of our own laboratory, essentially, that was doing yeah. a lot with um, autoimmune neurology, which is a term that I actually coined. But uh, now there's been tremendous advances in Europe, um, uh, in Barcelona, in Spain, and also in Germany and there's a, the quality of the neurology, the Academy of Neurology conferences, the American Academy of Neurology. I went last, I can't remember, I think it was just recent April. You know, it's absolutely superb. Previously, if I submitted an abstract for a meeting, it would be sent to a neuro-oncology section or to a multiple sclerosis section, you know, and everyone would just glaze over while mm. I was presenting. But now it's very vibrant. In fact, they have concurrent sessions in autoimmune neurology, which is extremely gratifying for me to see. It's a really amazing how the field has expanded and, and developed and matured. And like you said, uh, 20 years ago or even re more recently, there wasn't much going on outside of Mayo, actually, maybe mm -hmm. with a few exceptions. So, and you certainly played a role in that. Mm -hmm. Well, I know our listeners would love to hear if you have any examples or maybe specific cases where the testing that you've helped to develop over the years really played a pivotal role in diagnosing a patient or managing their condition. 
Um, I think the autoimmune GI dysmotilities have been um, a, a very pleasing outcome, especially it, initially it was the very most gross pseudo obstruction associated with small cell lung cancer and they have mm. this total paralysis from the esophagus to the anus you know and they'd have all these unnecessary surgeries and uh, uh, trying to look for a blockage in the bowel and it's autoimmune and the antibody profile tells you immediately what's going on and yeah. what, what cancer they've got it's usually small cell lung cancer or thymoma so there were many cases like that before the, the outside world really got to recognize that you could pick these things up by autoimmunity because the cancers are usually very very small difficult to find by interesting uh, so this could be a pre uh, presenting symptom that might be yeah. the first time that the patient even knows they have no idea idea otherwise that they have a malignancy right. and then and there's also now we went on to find uh, other antibodies with more focal less debilitating um, hypomotilities and sometimes hypermotilities, but nevertheless, they're extremely distressing and they tend to be labeled functional and they've yeah. got very definite, uh, functional is right, but it's phys physiologic, pathophysiological and the serology has been ahead of the uh, GI physiology, but the GI physiology is now catching up uh, in terms of circuitry of the enteric nervous system. Uh, the voltage-gated potassium channel complex, and now we know that's the LGI-1 and the CASPA-2, that was also when they presented with temporal lobe seizures and the imaging would show, uh, PET imaging would show, for example, uh, uh, hyperactivity in the temporal lobe and then so the neurosurgeons would be called in to do a biopsy of the tumor oh it's inflammatory well you yeah. know it, it would take us months to get the test approved for clinical testing and I was finding the antibody you know after the patient had the surgery but now that it saves the patients having surgery and those yeah. kinds of inflammatory central nervous system focal infl inflammations another one that's made a big difference is for unusual movement disorders and the whole stiff person syndrome um, spectrum. These disorders tend to affect women more than men, although the initial disease was described here in the 1950s at Mayo Clinic as stiff man syndrome. Man syndrome, but interesting. It, but it, it affects women more than men, but men were taken much more seriously and still are oh. when they have these weird symptoms. Women tend to be brushed aside as um, uh, hysterical. And, yeah. and now with these antibody testing, um, you can find that it is a very real entity and it is treatable, the treatment with diazepam for the classic stiff man syndrome, stiff person syndrome uh, was developed here at Mayo Clinic, the late Frank Howard with the diazepam therapy. Yeah. But then we are, we've we and others in Mayo and elsewhere have discovered other autoantibody markers of um, uh, movement disorders. And one of them is the paraneoplastic stiff person syndrome, which can be associated with breast or lung cancer. But in the women with the breast cancer, it's usually a very kind of stereotypic, but very unusual movement disorder. And those patients can go for years without the cancer being even suspected because the immune response against the cancer, which is spilling over to recognize the same antigen in the uh, nervous system, uh, is very effective in keeping the cancer under control. But that, that's the amphiphysin antibody. But I saw some really dramatic cases of that where they'd been overlooked for seven to 10 years before the cancer was actually found, breast cancer. And you, often it was an aberrant spread too. The mammogram is still looking negative, but they'd find a lymph node in the axilla. That was one that a doctor wrote to me at least 10 years ago. And he said, I was going through this patient's records. And eight years ago, you said, you wrote and said, 
look for a breast cancer. How did you know? It's eight years later and we still can't find anything in the breast, but this week we found it in an auxiliary node, you know. Wow. So they're the memorable cases. And of course, more recently with the um, Barcelona contributions, which have been profound, the NMDA receptor autoimmune encephalitis has been extraordinary. It can affect any age, but in children and juveniles, it's thought to be behavioral and uh, it's a treatable disease, but the sooner that you diagnose it and treat it appropriately, the, the kids start doing badly at school and they're acting out and it's not till they start having a movement disorder or a seizure that anyone even calls in a neurologist. In the meantime, they might be in prison or they might be in a locked ward in psychiatry. I mean, the, the the clinicians are now getting very well informed about these disorders, but these are the kinds of things we've encountered in the last two decades. Now, truly outstanding, amazing examples. And I like what you said that these disorders, at least many of them are treatable. And so the diagnosis that we make from laboratory medicine and pathology is just uh, life changing for these patients. Yeah, and it is immunotherapy, of course, and, mm -hmm. and removal of the cancer if it's found. Right. So now we, we've spent a lot of time looking back on all of the amazing accomplishments that you've been a part of. Uh, what do you envision for the future of neuroimmunology and testing? And uh, what potential impact do you think it will have on diagnosis, treatment, and understanding of our uh, these neurological disorders? Yeah, well, we're clearly only seeing the tip of the iceberg. Mm. And it's going to extend way beyond the nervous system. Um, I think the um, all of the special senses, uh, vision, we're recognizing more and more, not just the, the optic neuritis and retinitis, but also, you know, um, there's, I don't want to get into the specifics, but um, we have recognized autoimmune disorders of taste, but that's usually with other cranial neuropathies, but with the CRIMP5, for example. But I think there are going to be a lot of other special sense involved, for example, in GI dysfunction and irritable bowel syndrome, not that it's one syndrome. Hmm. Um, I think other endocrinopathies, the thyroid and the Addison's disease are very well established as autoimmune diseases before even myasthenia gravis, type 1 diabetes, but there's going to be a lot of other more subtle things. Um, I just think, and all of these things are going to be treatable. And also with the uh, recognition now of the importance of the immune system in controlling cancer and the introduction of checkpoint inhibitor therapies for cancer, that's taking the brakes off the immune response to cancer, which means a lot more autoimmunity is emerging. Some of it recognizable as a classic paraneoplastic syndrome, but others we've never seen before. And the clinical laboratory now is picking up new antibodies every few months that are found in a patient presenting with side effects of the checkpoint inhibitors. Fortunately, uh, in skilled hands, those complications are quite easy to deal with, back off on the checkpoint inhibitor, give them some steroids or some cyclophosphamide to get on top of the cancer and dampen down the immune system, but just mm. cautiously go back to the treatment. I mean, I think the future is very big for autoimmunity out beyond and including the nervous system. Mm -hmm. Well, it's great that we have experts like you and uh, the other members of our neuroimmunology team to lead us through this future. So that's exciting. Well, uh, Dr. London, thank you again so much for joining us today. A um, lot of great information. I really enjoyed speaking with you and uh, learning a lot. Thanks again. Thank you for inviting me, Bobby. Thank you so much for tuning in to Answers from the Lab. Be sure to subscribe to this podcast and don't forget to tune in every Thursday and every other Tuesday.